I am Dr. Michael Klein, the CTO and Medical Director of the Keystone Dental Group, which is composed of Keystone Dental, as well as Paltop Advanced Dental Solutions. And I would like to welcome you to the first in a series of very informative and educational webinars from speakers around the world. Now, this is not how I normally look, but after being in my house for oh, approximately three weeks, you've got to give me a, a little leeway. Now, I'd like to welcome our audience. We have audiences from all around the world. We have uh, attendees that are coming from Argentina, from Bosnia-Herzegovina, from Colombia, from Cyprus, from Czechoslovakia, the Dominican Republic, France, Greece, India, Indonesia, Israel, the Philippines, the Russian Federation, Spain, Turkey, United Kingdom, United States, and Vietnam. And I hope you're all staying home and staying safe and healthy. Now, just a couple of notes before we begin, um, because of uh, potential uh, you know, issues with seeing this transmission. Number one, if you're using headphones, unplug them. Listen directly from your computer. The headphones sometimes cause complication in the platform. Number two, there's massive internet usage going on. Everybody is watching Netflix. And so if you have a problem and something isn't working, just exit and then re-enter. And if, again, you're having internet usage in your country and it's problematic, this entire webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to see it and watch it on the Paltop educational platform. I would also encourage you to visit our recently launched Paltop Academy, which is full of case reports and videos and lectures and webinars and all kinds of interesting information. And I'd also like to invite you to contribute materials that you may have that others may find of interest. We will have questions at the end of the presentation, but if there's something that you weren't able to ask or we weren't able to get to, you're welcome to go ahead and email me at m.klein at altopdental.com. Now, currently I am in Israel. I've been here around five weeks or so since uh, the advent of, of Corona, but prior to that, there was you know, a very vibrant life here from the old city walls of Jerusalem to the young, vibrant uh, nightlife and our beautiful land and scenery. And so even 10 days ago, when we were still kind of confined close to our houses, here you see I'm out taking a walk with uh, getting some exercise with my wife, uh, in the neighborhood around my house and with my daughter. But this is what we've been reduced to now. Now we need to wear, as of last night, masks in the street. And there you see my daughter and she's kind of just the now uh, vegging out on the couch talking to her uh, friends or playing with her phone. Now, my grandchildren during the same 10 day time period seem to be faring fairly well. Although more recently, you know, some of them were doing better than the others. Here they look a little concerned about what's, uh, what's going on. And so, again, not long ago, probably, oh, six weeks ago, I was with my uh, good friend and colleague, Philip Segal. We were lecturing in Guadalajara, Mexico, and enjoying uh, uh, the local alcohol uh, tequila. So I believe, you know, if you have lemons, make lemonade. So being that you're not in a lecture hall, but you're sitting home, put your feet up, open a bottle of wine, pour a glass for yourself, pour some tequila for yourself, and sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation. So I'm a wet-fingered dentist, prosthodontist, um, and like most of you, on a daily basis, I treat patients. And so I'd like to introduce you to one of my patients. This is Carol. Next month, I'll be 96, and I'm glad I'm getting the implant so I don't bite the inside of my mouth, and I will be able to taste the food and enjoy it. So technology, right? It's all around us. 
We see it in journals. We hear it from the podiums of conferences. We see it in the exhibit halls. But I have the same questions that most of you have, and that's what do we do with it? Is it useful? Is it productive? Is it cost effective? And does, does it produce the type of treatment that I want to provide my patients? Or really the bottom line, is there value using technology for clinical dentistry? So for me, value comes in three forms. Can it make me more efficient in what I do? Can I be more effective in the treatment that I provide? And I can, can I be more predictable in how I manage and treat my patients? So let's go uh, you know, right to the source. Let's go to a patient of mine. And this patient is the, my favorite type of patient. And can anybody guess why? Well, if you take a look at, uh, at the picture here, you'll see in the x-ray that there's an implant. That's this tooth right over here. And I placed this implant a number of years ago. And so the patient walks in today and the patient looks very much like she looked when she walked in a number of years ago for me to treat the adjacent tooth. And so this is why she's a favorite type of patient of mine, because I don't need to explain to her anything. She's coming in, she knows what the treatment procedure is going to be, she knows how long it's going to take, she knows what, how much it's going to cost, and she just wants to get started with treatment. So let's go ahead and, and manage, this, uh, manage this patient and go through a, a protocol the way that I manage patients in my clinic every day. So we take two sets of data. One set of data, we take a comb beam CT, and the second set of data is we take an intraoral surface scan. Now, the intraoral surface scan can just as easily be replaced with a laboratory scan of a model of the patient. The laboratory will go ahead and perform a virtual diagnostic wax up, which in this case is a mirror image of the adjacent tooth. They then combine the two data sets together, home beam CT with the intraoral surface scan with its virtual wax up of how I want the patient's tooth to appear once the treatment is done. And I end up with a result like this. So I'm looking at my comb beam CT. I see a profile of the gingival tissue as it exists now. And I see a profile also of the virtual wax up from the incisal edge to the CEJ that I want to develop for the patient. And then the laboratory can go ahead and plan placement of the implant pending my approval. Now, once I can do that, I can start to implement another level of predictability. And that's by going ahead and using evidence-based criteria from the literature to properly position my implant to get the anticipated result or the result that I would like to get. So let's go over just some of that, those, uh, those information or some of those rules. For an aesthetic implant, what do we know? We want to position the implant so it is three to four millimeters apical to the buccal free gingival margin. How do I know that? Well, it comes from the literature, right? Here for an article by Stephen Chu and Salama and Garber and Dennis Tarnow, right? They went ahead and, and uh, conducted actually uh, two different studies between them and to develop a proper emergence profile, we know that we want to position the implant three to four millimeters apical, where we would like to develop the free gingival margin. Rule number two, we need to take into consideration that there's going to be horizontal bone loss once this tooth is extracted. So we know that we need to go ahead and place the implant two millimeters from where the buccal plate is to allow for that resorption of bone. And then we need to take into account our uh, vertical resorption of bone as well. So we're going to go ahead and place the implant a half a millimeter to one millimeter apical, okay, to where that buccal crestal bone is. And we know all of this from the literature. So we develop a complete evidence-based treatment plan to position the implant so we can end up with a predictable aesthetic result for our patient. We take that, that, uh, that data set of the implant position, with the virtual wax up, and we create our tools, which in this case will be a surgical guide. So the implant can be positioned in that exact position, location, angle, and depth. 
and we machine or from the manufacturing file created from this virtual wax up a provisional crown, which is a mirror image of the adjacent tooth. The patient comes in for surgery. I do an atraumatic extraction. I'm using a tool here called Benex, which is vertically extracting the tooth. Now, if you recall what the original periapical radiograph looked like, there really isn't any problem or it's not a complex tooth to extract, but I want to prevent any luxation of tooth of the tooth in the anterior aesthetic zone because I know that luxation, right, will expand the bone and when it expands the bone, it's going to create micro fractures in the buccal cortical plate, which will lead to, right, a greater chance of resorption of that bone and I want to prevent as much resorption as I possibly can. So using the Benex tool, I can vertically extract the tooth. And there are several other systems that can do this also in a very similar manner. I then place my surgical guide. I drill through the guide and I insert my implant. Here, a Paltop advanced implant is placed into position. So it's done again, flaplessly. There's no reason to go ahead and reflect any flap. And there you see the implant. And there's going to be a, a, an intrabony bone graft done between where the buckle of the implant is and that buccal cortical plate, because remember, we left it a millimeter distance, which we were taught in the literature. Now, if we're going to be doing immediate provisionalization, which is the plan for this patient, right, because we want to support the adjacent tissue with the proper contours and shapes of the, of the tooth, I want to, again, objectively ascertain if I have enough stability of that implant to, to, to load it. And so, again, we have a tool that we can use today. We have a tool that will take an ISQ measurement. There are several different types. The kind that uh, I'm using here is called Ostel, and it takes an ISQ measurement. So what is that? It's a measurement of stability of the implant. So if I were to give you an example of how this works, what you see here is you're seeing a, a uh, metal rod or titanium rod with a basically a magnet on top. And we take a special wand and it bounces an ultrasound wave off the magnet and measures the amount of time it comes takes to come back to that uh, to that device and it assigns it a number here the number is 71 okay is 71 a good number well the literature tells me so i know this from this article that says uh if we have numbers of 70 plus it is relatively safe to immediately provisionalize an implant now, it's not as simple as that. You know, what's the occlusal scheme? Can it be relieved? Is it a single tooth? Is it protected by adjacent teeth? Is it a full arch? You know, what's the anterior posterior spread to the implants? And there are many factors that come into it. So along with a number like this, we need to make a you know, clinical assessment. And so again, in selecting the type of implant that I'm going to go ahead and use, I wanna know that the geometry, the external geometry of that implant give me good initial stability. So I went ahead and did my own internal study in my practice, and I took the first 281 Paltop implants that I had pl ever placed. And so I took these implants, and I took two measurements on each implant, which gave me a total of 562 measurements. And so because it was these first consecutive implants, right, it included the full range of implants from 3.25 millimeters in diameter all the way to five millimeters in diameter and from, you know, eight millimeters in length all the way up to 16 millimeters in length. I excluded nobody because this was really a measure of initial stability, right, not of healing. And I placed it in, in a full range of, uh, of clinical techniques, everything from, you know, extraction, immediate implant placement, to using uh, osteotomes, to placement in sinus grafts. And so because I used it in a full range of activities, my range value was from 43 to 90, but my average number is 73.5. So if I wanted to evaluate, is the geom geometry or the external geometry of the palp implant good to give you good initial stability? Well, take a look. In the full range, I'm getting 73.5, and we learned from this article here, right? Uh, one of the authors, Peter Moy from UCLA, that numbers of 70 plus, right, give us good enough stability for media provisionalization. So it's a good geometric design for initial stabilization. But you're probably asking, okay, that's really good and nice, 
But uh, how does the implant do over time? Because that's really what the, this tool or IS2 measurement was done for or designed for. It was you would take a measurement at the time the implant was placed. And after healing, you would take a second measurement and look for the trend were the numbers going up or the numbers going down. And was it was it in a range good enough to go ahead and restore the implant? So let's take a look. I went ahead and took 43 consecutive patients with 100 implants and took 400 measurements, two measurements on the day the implant was placed and two measurements on the day the implant was ready to be restored. That's why it's one and a half to six months because it's at the time of restoration. So at the time of placement, my average numbers were 7173. And at the time of the restoration, it was 7475. So it's essentially the same number. So for me, that's good. Why? A 70 is a good stability number to begin with. And if I can maintain that number, right, I have a, an implant that's healed well. So it's an implant that's going to heal well in all types of bone, in all types of types of procedures. Let's move on with our procedure. We're now going to immediately provisionalize it. And I've taken a component. This is the Paltap Peak component, right? And you'll see there's a concave design um, at, from the abutment connection. I'm going to talk that, about that in just one minute. I've gone ahead and created some of my own mechanical retention just with a round burr because I like to reline my provisionalist with acrylic. If I was going to go ahead and use composite, I wouldn't need to create mechanical retention. But acrylic doesn't stick to peak, and therefore I need to do that. I then take my... PMMA machined provisional restoration, which is a mirror image of the adjacent tooth, right? And I just slide it into place. And you can see, because this is a whole digital protocol, right? So the shape and contours are exactly what I want. It's a mirror image of the adjacent tooth, along with a, uh, a hole that was created digitally to exactly accommodate this provisional abutment. Now, let's just talk about this concave design because this is kind of critical. Now, I'm a prosthodontist, and I was trained that when you had an implant, what you did was you, you ascertained where the, where the emergence profile needed to be from the head of the implant to the contours of where the tooth or provisional was going to come out of the soft tissue, and you gradually built out that subgingival section to support the tissues or adjacent tissues until you got to the right emergence profile. And then I met Paltop, and that was around 2014 when I started placing and restoring Paltop implants, so six years ago. And they had a whole different concept, and the difference in concept was, wow, instead of going and making a, a subgingival section that was wider and wider and wider to support the soft tissues. This is what I had, had done for, oh, maybe almost 30 years before that. Their concept was, no, we're going to have a concave design. And we have concave components, concave healing abutments, and concave impression copings to match, and concave provisional components, and concave definitive uh, uh, prefabricated components. And the concept was, wow, you know what we want to do? We want to go ahead and increase space for the soft tissue to heal, to maximize vascularity, and end up with very robust soft tissue. And so, you know, I started to follow that concept. And then just recently, oh, a little over a year ago, going on close to two years ago, an article came out. Um, and I learned this article in a lecture I attended that was given by uh, German Gallucci from Harvard University. And it showed me something very interesting. And this was really the first scientific evidence that I found that supported this theory of, well, you're better off. You're going to end up with better, more robust, healthier soft tissue. You're going to maximize the volume of soft tissue by having a concave design. And what they did in this study is they studied the difference between – different designs of healing abutments. One that had uh, a, a relatively um, you know, more divergent uh, emergence profile versus a much narrower abutment segment. So this is much closer to what we would talk about, you know, what I was trained in going from the connection of the implant to support the tissue coming out gradually versus something that's much narrower. And this is what they found when they compared the two. They found the more wide and divergent, right, you were from the head of the implant till you came out of the soft tissue, 
What happened is it induced an apical displacement of the peri-implant biologic width and resulted in more bone remodeling. So you actually had bone loss from the bone remodeling in an attempt right, to create a peri-implant biologic width by going in and having a, a more wide and divergent abutment as opposed to a narrower abutment. So let's take a look at our patient. When we look at our patient, here's the implant that was placed, and there's the provisional restoration, right? And so how do we get from the connection of the implant to what we want to be an aesthetic emergence profile? Because this is what traditionally I was taught and what I had done, that's how I got from there. I, I gradually came out and I supported the adjacent soft tissues. Except what were we taught in this article and what did we learn? We learned that when you use that kind of concept and design, I had more apical displacement of the peri-implant biologic width or bone loss, right? I had bone loss, some initial bone loss around that, around that implant. And instead I should be moving, I should be moving to something that's narrower as it emerges from the, from the implant or something that's more like a concave design where it's narrower as it comes off the platform, and then it eventually, when it emerges through the soft tissue, is wide enough to have a proper emergence profile. So there we see, how do we do that? It's the concave design. So we can be narrow where we come off the connection. We can even narrower it a little bit more, okay, even be more narrow, and then widen ourselves out to meet proper uh, aesthetic design for the emergence profile. So let's move on with our procedure. Here we have our patient, and I'm going to do a sub-epithelial connected tissue graft, right, to fill out that buccal soft tissue. Now, for many years, what I did was I would extract the tooth, I would place the implant, I'd place the provisional restoration, and I would say to the patient, well, part of your treatment will be after initial healing, after, oh, two to four months, we'll reassess to see if you need filling out of that soft tissue. But what I found over time was that in any of these aesthetic cases, I would always have healthy tissue afterwards. However, it always looked somewhat flat because I had resorption of that buccal bone. I don't care how atraumatic the extraction was, and I don't care what, whether I grafted that intrabony defect between the buccal cortical plate and the implant, or what I grafted it with, or how densely I packed that graft material. It always ultimately flattened. And so today, part of my regular protocol or workflow for any aesthetic case is to incorporate with that placing a connective tissue graft. Now, initially when I did this, what I would do is I would make an intracellular incision, right? Intracellular incision to create a pocket. And I would harvest connective tissue from the palate and I would try and stuff it into that pocket. And half the time would, when I stuffed on one side, it would pop out the other side and I'd stuff it and it would pop out. And so I said, okay, maybe I need to cut the papilla <clears throat> and reflect the flap. So, you know, I'm concerned, I don't wanna cut the papilla. But what I learned from Dennis Tarnow is that, wow, if I have five millimeters or less from the, the tip of the interceptal bone, to where the contact point is, that papilla will fill, oh, 90 plus percent of the time. And, and Garber and Salama showed if it was four millimeters. So I would take my probe before I cut the papilla and I would measure, and if I had four millimeters or less, I would say it's safe. I can cut the papilla, put in my connective tissue, put in my provisional, and then I would wait for the papilla to return. And I can wait three months, and I can wait six months, and I can wait a year, and I can wait two years. And yes, it will eventually come back if you fold, follow those rules. But I'd rather not have to wait. And so I learned a new technique, and I learned this from a lecturer I saw from a periodontist from UCLA by the name of Homozana. And what I do is I make a vertical incision uh, in the, in the uh, uh, buccal mucosa, and then I tunnel up underneath all the way, lifting this uh, whole gingival complex, and then I will harvest connective tissue from the palate. I tack it with my suture, and I pull it through the tunnel up into the area uh, right in the, you know, in front of the implant. And so there you see it there, pulled into position. Now I will take my provisional restoration, 
with its concavity and I will seat it into place. And when I seat it into place, I take one end of each suture and I make sure it's on either side of the provisional crown. So I've placed what looks like a horizontal mattress suture through the gingival uh, 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 connective tissue graft, not the gingival, but the connective tissue graft. And so I have two ends of suture. And I pull one end on either end of the provisional restoration. And there you can see my two ends. I seat my provisional restoration into place, and then I pull the two ends of the suture so that connective tissue gets pulled into the cavity of the provisional restoration. And then I will go and I will just tie off the suture around the neck of the implant on the palate. And you can see how nicely it fills out that area. So here's how the patient walks out the door. This entire procedure is very efficient from extraction, to implant placement with a, our guide for the exact positioning, to provisionalization with our prefabricated provisional machined to exact specifications to mirror image the adjacent tooth, as well as then going and doing the connective tissue procedure. So not a long procedure at all. And here's what the post-operative x-ray looks like. Now here's what the patient looks like four months later. Four months later. And so let's compare to where we started. So if we compare soft tissue and I, I make a line from the adjacent uh, free gingival margins and compare it to where we are now, well, we have a neck gain of tissue. So that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. If we compare the total volume of tissue, so there we are on the day of implant placement. And while we have a, we have a large gain of tissue, predictably from the connective tissue graft. And here we are, the, the case was restored by a, a local restorative doctor, excellent restorative doctor by the name of Casavikas, and she restored both of the crowns. So several years before she restored the first implant, and now she restored the second implant. Now, when I look at these two implants, or I look at the patient's smile, I say, wow, you know, one looks better than the other. And yet, the same person placed both implants, that was me, and the same person restored both implants, and that was Dr. Dr. Kasavigas. So what's the difference? Why does one look different than the other? So let's examine it, because only if I can identify the, the essential element of what's different can I predictably reproduce the better result that I always want to. So what's the first thing that I see? Well, let's go and take a look at the pretreatment x-ray, and you'll see that yeah, the soft tissues that surround the crown haven't changed at all you know, at that point. So it's not that, okay, post-surgically, this tooth looked worse. It looks the same as before we started. So number one, we look at the papilla or pseudo-papilla that surround crown, right? One looks better than the other. We look at the free gingival margin, and one looks better than the other, not because it was sculpted, because that's how we remodel relative to the shapes of the restoration. We look at the bone levels. Well, they both look good. And so the major difference that I can see is what's happening, what I will call this transgingival section. So what's happening from the connection to where the crown emerges from the tooth? And you see the difference, the difference in concept. One concept was a constant flare as opposed to having a narrower segment or something more of a concave design that only flares out, out and emerges from the soft tissue. Again, allowing for more robust, healthy tissue, greater vascularity to that area. So to do the procedure as a, as a whole, and again, we talked about doing this efficiently, even though we did multiple things, involves the following steps. We need to collect the data, which is our comb beam CT, and either intraoral scan or diagnostic models. The laboratory does a virtual wax up. The laboratory does a surgical planning. And then the doctor, or in this case, I verified, okay, and or adjusted. And then the laboratory will go ahead and fabricate whatever devices are necessary. And that could be a surgical guide, it could be a provisional, as in our case. It could be a custom healing abutment or custom abutment. And once all that's done, go to surgery. But you know, um, we talked about efficiencies, and it looks like a lot of steps here, and I told you one of the things that creates value for me is being efficient. So in the digital age, this is all we're really involved with. 
We collect the data in my office, okay? CAT scan, cone beam CT, and diagnostic models or intral surface scan. And the next visit, we go right to surgery. So it's very efficient to go ahead and do this kind of treatment. Now, I had a, a young lady, oh, about 80 years old, come to my, come to my office. And uh, my clinic is in New York. And so we experienced something called snowbirds. What are snowbirds? Snowbirds are when you have someone who lives in the warmer months in New York. And when it gets cold in New York, you get on the plane and you go down to Florida. That's called a snowbird. So this 80-year-old uh, woman comes into my office and says, I fractured off the crown on my tooth. There we see it's missing. Um, and I need to have something done. I'd like an implant. See, I had one done before. And I can tell you, looking, it was done nicely for her. Um, and, um, you know, I know there's a healing period, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm 80. I'm not wearing anything removable. And I look at this and I think, okay, well, I can take off this implant crown, right? They make up, use it to, to hold a provisional cantilever. She's not interested in me taking off this crown or touching it. You know, it's good, doing well for her. And I can't use the adjacent tooth. Take a look at this. This is the next one that's going to require an, an implant. So we talk about and say, okay, can we immediately provisionalize this tooth? Now, I'm not excited because it's cuspid. Cuspids are dangerous teeth to immediately provisionalize, even if you can completely remove all the you know, excursive and protrusive movements from it. But she had a relatively favorable occlusion with minimal overbite and overjet. And so the plan was, and what we in fact did was extract the tooth, place the implant, and immediately provisionalize the patient. And off the patient goes to Florida. The patient comes back seven months later. And when she comes back seven months later, I am prepared, right, to take a look and say, okay, you know, I, I, I'm expecting the implant to have integrated, but perhaps I may even have a little, you know, crestal bone loss around the implant because this is an eight-year-old woman. She's going to Florida. She's not thinking about, you know, that tooth that I placed. You know, it's comfortable for her. She's thinking about, you know, what she's having for breakfast, who she's going to uh, lunch with, which one of her friends, and about her Mahjong game that she's going to play later on in the day and our implant is the last thing that she's going to be thinking about and so she's probably abused it somewhat and so i take my x-ray and this is what i see i say wow you know that looks pretty good i don't think i have any crystal bone loss let me take a closer look and so here's what the implant looked like on the day of extraction and we can see you know we have some space to the head of the implant because it's an extraction socket here you see is the platform switch and here is the beginning of the prosthetic component. Okay, right there. And now if we take a look seven months later when she returns, what do I see? I see what appears to be, okay, not bone loss, but it looks like I have bone that's grown over the platform switch. And on the other side, it's, you know, solidified at the platform switch. And with, you know, complete fill of bone, you know, along the areas of the extraction socket. And I say, you know, I want to go back and, and examine some more of my patients because I wasn't expecting this phenomena. I was expecting the implant to do well, to integrate, okay? But I was expecting it to be abused a little bit and therefore not have a result like this. And so routinely when patients come back after I provide treatment before we're going to restore the implant, right? Or even, even on recall basis, we take x-rays and I look at the x-rays. I generally don't examine them unless there's something wrong. I said, let me go back and start examining some of my other x-rays. So I went and I took a look at this patient. And if you look at this patient, here you see this is an x-ray taken on the day final restoration was going to be placed. So here you see the custom abutments were just inserted. And if you look, you can see uh, here's the platform switch. And you see there's a little space here to, uh, you know, around the platform switch. And you see a little radiolucency over here, maybe down to the first micro thread. And when I look at this implant here, again, I see a little bit of space over there. And when I look at the distal, this implant, wow, it looks like I even have a little bit of bone loss, maybe a millimeter or so of, of bone loss. Okay, nothing, nothing terrible. And then I look at it two, almost two and a half years later. So it's not two and a half years after implant placement. It's two and a half years after the restoration was placed. And now take a look at it. If I look at this area over here, well, it looks like the bones solidified and become very dense all the way up to, right, the platform switch. And here, the same thing, a little bit over the platform switch. 
and here the same thing actually over the over you know halfway over the platform switch again you know look what it looked like here now two and a half years later and look at the distal over here it looks like I've grown bone vertically up over the platform switch. Now, I don't believe that I've necessarily grown bone vertically. What I do believe is that there's an initial remodeling process. We know that bone is constantly changing for oh, at least the first 18 months or so after the implant is placed. And so there's a remodeling process that's going on. The question is, during that remodeling, when the bone finally finishes that process, where is the bone going to be left? Is the bone kind of being chased away? Almost like from the original Brandemark literature that said you should expect, oh, about a millimeter or so of bone loss you know in the first in, in the first year because it, it remodeled and you lost that bone when it remodeled here instead of remodeling and losing bone we're remodeling and we're and it's and it's turning into bone so the bone is becoming denser Take a look at a different case there i just showed you a posterior mandible here's an anterior maxilla here's an implant narrow palt up narrow platform it almost looks like we may have some bone loss at the day of insertion of the restoration now look two years and four months post insertion of the restoration look at that look at the difference okay look where look where the where it appears i have bone that's missing over here and look where i have bone here so in remodeling, it remodeled and became healthier, right, and stabilized at this point. But I said, let me go ahead and look through a number of patients and do a little study on this. And so what I'm going to show you here is the, and describe to you, is a study that I conducted. And this is an article that I published along with Dennis Tarno. As a matter of fact, it was just published and put online yesterday. And uh, you're welcome to read this article. It's published in Compendium Online. Uh, we'll give you the the link, um, you know, uh, at the end of this uh, at the end of this presentation and lecture. And if you don't catch it or we forget to do that, you're again welcome to go ahead and email me, you know, for the link, and we'll be happy to provide it for you. So here's what what uh, what uh, we did. What I wanted to do was to retrospectively look. This is not a prospective study, but a retrospective study and look for changes uh, in bone once the abutment was inserted and it was functionally loaded. So the comparison is from the time the restoration is inserted to some point later on with functional loading. And then we evaluated all different aspects, the implant type, the diameter and width, was it put into heel bone, was it put into an extraction socket, was it pro immediately provisionalized? What was the abutment type? You know, a multi-unit, a single unit, a stock abutment, custom abutment, high bases. Was the restoration cemented? Was it screw retained? Were they splinted, right? We were looking at all of these factors. And I did this by taking 50 consecutive, consecutive patients with 87 implants. They were gone. It was a, a radiographic study. The radiographs were not standardized. However, we had very strict criteria which x-rays could be included, you know, in this. And so it was from the time of final abutment insertion, which was, you know, from as low as 11 months to the follow-up up to four years. Again, not from implant placement, but from implant restoration. So, you know, what were our results? Well, take a look. The results were 30% of the implant surfaces showed bone improvement. So let me show you this, blow it up, and, and because this is remarkable to me. I, I, was, I was quite frankly kind of, you know, shocked. The result was 30% of implant surfaces showed bone improvement. Now, why do I say bone improvement and not one-tenth of a millimeter, one millimeter? The reason for that is, again, because it's a non-standardized x-ray, but, okay, but very strict criteria. And just like you can have, let's go call it, uh, you know, uh, elongation of x-rays, you can have foreshortening of x-rays. And so through the numbers of implants and x-rays, that would all wash out. But we just look for trends, bone increasing, bone decreasing, bone staying the same. And this is what we found, 30% increase of bone, 30% of the time, bone you know, seem to improve. 62% of the time, we showed bone maintenance, okay, which means 92% of the time over the length of the study, up to four years, 
uh, after restoration. Okay, after restoration, right, 92% of the time the bone maintained or improved. And 8% showed a decrease. Well, if we look at the decrease, we're talking about maybe 0.1 millimeter to a maximum of one millimeter. So still well within the criteria that Brandemark originally, you know, taught us and, and trained us and trained us in. So the question is, why are we seeing this? So I ascertain, or my hypothesis is, is three factors. One has to do with the Paltop implant with an, an ultra-pure SLA surface treatment. Two, a concept of the concave design in the trans gingival segment and the use of very precise tolerances in manufacturing. All those things leading to a reduction in inflammation because it's in this inflammatory process caused by bacteria that cause, right, the breakdown of bone around the, around the implant. So let's go over each of those elements. So first, let's talk about SLA treatment. Sand blasting, large grit, acid etching. Most implants today that have surface treatment use this type of treatment, SLA. So, you know, shouldn't you expect the same results with all of these implants? So I'm going to give you the recipe for SLA. So any of you who are, you know, relatively motivated and innovative and you want to manufacture some implants in your garage, right? You can machine out an implant and I'm giving you the recipe to SLA. So number one, you machine your implant. Now, when you machine the implant, you have to cool, right, the titanium rod as it's being cut by the machine, just like we cool bone when we drill. But when we drill in bone, we cool it with saline. When we drill inside a machine, the machine titanium, we use oil. So the first process, once the implant is manufactured, is clean off the oil. Next, we need to start to create the roughness on the implant. And so we sandblast it with aluminum oxide particles. And then we clean off the aluminum oxide particles. Then we passivate it with nitric, uh, nitric acid. And then we create the micro, and we clean that off. And then we create the micro pitting, right? The uh, inside the macro roughness, right? By acid etching, okay, the surface of the implant. And then we clean off the acids. That's the recipe for SLA. Now, there was a study done by Professor Dirk Dudak, the University of Helm, or for people from the United States, University of Cologne. And he looked at and examined 120 different brands of implants. And he looked, wanted to examine what, how pure is the surface of the implant. And he found that uh, Paltop has one of the purest surface of any implant brand from difference of 120 companies. And if you can, you're welcome to go ahead and look at the study. You can find this study uh, online. You can find it in the Paltop website uh, and they'd be happy to, you know, show you where to get reprints so you can read this and you can see the different companies that are compared, you know, inside there. So the question is, is, uh, you know, how did he do this study? He did it by using something called XPS analysis, which analyzes the surface of the implant, right? Uh, on an elemental level. And that's how the process was developed for the, the SLA process within Paltop. Paltop's founder is a man by the name of Sam Topaz. And before he was in the dental implant business, he was in the business of precision machining, but for the areas such as the petrochemical industry, for the aerospace industry, and for the semiconductor industry. industry. Now, in the semiconductor in industry, right, you need to have a, a, an ultra pure surface of materials, probably a thousand times cleaner and pure than any medical device. Now, can you believe that? To, to make your computer work or to make your phone work, the surfaces of those components need to be cleaner than what we put inside our patients' bodies. So he understood coming from that industry, he understood the concepts of uh, surface purity. And he said, well, it makes sense to me that I'm um, putting something in the human body, it needs to have a pure surface. And so in the development of the SLA 
process is a basic recipe. And then within the recipe, how you do it varies from company to company. And then the development of the process for Paltop, he would he, he came up with a, his recipe for SLA, and then he would do an XPS analysis, right, which would go on a, on the on a, an electron microscopic level, analyzes right elementally what's on the surface, and he kept on changing the process and altering the process until he came out with a 100 percent pure surface. So if we look here at the XPS analysis, this is what we see: uh, the Paltop implant is titanium alloy, so there's carbon. Titanium, oxygen, aluminum, vanadium, titanium alloy, those are the components, and nitrogen. That's what you're going to go ahead and see. But there's nothing else on the surface of that implant. Until today, batches, as batches of implants are produced, uh, sampling is taken for XPS analysis to make sure you know there's quality control, that the process continues to provide an ultra pure surface of implant. And if you look at some of the other major brands of implants, and I won't talk about names, we see that that's not necessarily true, and these are brands you would all know. So this particular brand has commercially pure titanium. How do I know? Because it has on the surface carbon, titanium, that's good, oxygen. There's no aluminum and vanadium because it's commercially pure titanium. Uh, titanium. No calcium, there's nitrogen, should be there. Take a look, there's zinc. Why is there zinc on the surface of the implant? Remember I told you, you have to clean the surface of the implant during the SLA process. You clean off the oil, you clean off the, the acids, but what do you clean it with? You clean it with water. What's inside water? Zinc. Wow, okay. In an attempting to clean the surface of the implant, surface impurity is left on the implant. Take a look at this brand, titanium alloy, carbon, titanium, oxygen, aluminum, vanadium, calcium, nitrogen, but look at this, phosphorus, sulfur, zinc, chlorine, right? What, wh where's that coming from? Well, it's coming from residue of the acids that are used to create the micro pitting. Silicon, where's that coming from? The aluminum oxide that's creating the macro roughness, the, that's blasting the implant. So the surface impurities are left on there from the process and they're not cleaned off. And even the cleaning creates more surface impurity. So the question is, is why should I care? You know, um, you know, I've been taught, you know, by virtually every implant manufacturer that um, that, you know, we have 97 percent success when we place our implants. Right. And you know what? Maybe it's true. Except that initial integration is caused by the external geometry of the of the implant, which gives its initial stability. And that's what causes that. So, you know, I came across this article, and this was approximately, oh, a year and a half ago. And it was produced by the Department of Periodontology at Hebrew University, Hadassah Medical Center, right? And um, it was published not in a dental journal, but actually in a journal called Frontiers in, in Immunology, a very high impact journal in medicine. And here's the title, Impaired Differentiation of Langerian Cells in the Murine Oral Epithelium Adjacent to Titanium Implants. Wow. You know what I do when I open a journal and I see that title? I turn the page and go to a different article, right? Um, but this article is actually, you know, relatively or very important. And why is it? Well, what they wanted to do in the Department of Periodontics was this. They understood that um, there's an alarming rate of periimplantitis. Oh, you know, in the literature you'll find numbers 25 to you know, 40 or 50 percent of implants experience periimplantitis. And they said, we want to develop a model to study this. We need to study this so we can find out why is it happening and what can we do to prevent it. So they made some little uh, mouse-sized implants. They placed the implants into, a, into mice because that's what they wanted to develop and test as a model for studying periimplantitis. They allowed the implants to heal, they sacrificed the, the mice, and they took samples and analyzed the tissue. Now, inside tissues around teeth, there's something called Langerhans cells. We know this from the periodontal literature. What are Langerhans cells? Langerhans cells are basically the body's antibody response or immune response system, right, uh, against bacteria that are normally inside a patient's mouth. They went looking for these Langerhans cells, and what they found was this. They found that 
the precursor cells to Langer hand cells were there actually in increased numbers more than they would normally expect. But when they were looking for the Langer hand cells themselves, they were significantly reduced. Wow, significantly reduced. I just told you the purpose of the Langer hand cells, right, is the antibody response or the immune system response, right, to fight off bacteria. And now they're missing or significantly impaired. And they theorized, you know, why is that? They theorized this. They say, we know from the literature that titanium ions are released from the surface of implants. And their theory was that these titanium ions, right, they prevented the differentiation of the, of the precursor cells into the Langerhans cells. So they damaged those cell, precursor cells, right, so the Langerhans cells, they never, never developed. So what's the impact of that? What does that have to do with surface impurity? So let's go back to the beginning. And what's the type of material that we use for our implants? Titanium or titanium alloy? Why was that material chosen? Well, one of the reasons is it develops a very strong oxide layer. It passivates regularly and forms a strong oxide layer. So what does that mean? It means it forms strong chemical bonds on the surface that holds the metal intact. So if I were to take a, a nail, a metal nail, throw it into a glass of water, what would happen? It rusts. Why does it rust? Because it oxidizes. What does that mean? It means the chemical bonds on the surface of that metal are not strong, of iron. They're not strong. And so what happens is it's easy for the ions to be peeled off the surface, right? Off the surface, and that's what causes this oxidation and rusting of the, of the nail. And so what do we know? We know that if you have surface impurity on a surface, it will create holes in the oxide layer. If it creates holes in the oxide layer, what's going to happen? Well, then I hypothesize and theorize that if there are holes in the oxide layer, you will have additional or more ions released. If you have more ions released, what's going to happen? You're going to impair more Langerhans cells and you're going to impair right the body's the body's antibody system or immune response to bacteria and that's why it's important to go ahead and have a, a impurity free surface not because of the initial integration that's caused by geometry of the implant the question is what's going to happen over two three four five years and if you impair body's ability to fight off bacteria, right? You're going to have more bacteria, which are going to cause bacterial infiltrate, which are going to cause inflammation and bone breakdown. Factor number one. Number two, we talked about the concave design and the importance of the concave design as opposed to this, uh, this more um, uh, wide and divergent approach in having healthier soft tissue because you have less remodeling right, or more remodeling around the more wide and divergent abutment. And so the net result of that is to have very healthy and robust soft tissue. And what we see here is that, and you see these vertical striations. And so what is this? So what kind of attachment do we have between soft tissue and between the implant abutment? So we know we have hemidesmosomes, it's kind of like glue, and circular gingival fibers. Well, the healthier that soft tissue is, the tighter the circular gingival fibers are going to be, right? And the better they're gonna hold the hemidesmosomes into place, which means what? Which means it's gonna be more difficult for the bacteria to penetrate, right, into that zone. If they don't penetrate into that zone, right, they're again, not causing, you know, the inflammatory response relative to the, to the endotoxins that they go ahead and produce. So again, less inflammation, less bone breakdown. And then we know that we need to have precise machining and tolerances because we know if we have micro movement at the abutment connection, right, we're going to have bacterial infiltrate. And again, we're going to have more inflammation in response to those. So those three things become paramount in, in, in preventing, okay, in preventing bone breakdown, which I believe is what occurs in what I was seeing. The reason we're seeing bone improvement is because we're allowing the patient's body or bone to do what it naturally wants to do. And that is to remodel in a positive sense after it's been traumatized by the initial implant surgery. 
And instead of the bone being lost because the implant at that point is offending it, okay, we're having bone solidify and, and, uh, and condense around the head of the implant. Let's take a look at uh, um, uh, some clinical cases. So here's a patient generally missing uh, two mandibular incisors. I treat many, many children born missing teeth. And I'm going to show you two cases, you know, right now. So difficult case, right? Why is it a difficult case? Well, number one, we have two teeth in the dealing in the aesthetic zone and they're adjacent to each other. So the ability to go ahead and predictably develop a nice parabolic architecture, right? Gingival architecture of the, you know, the soft tissues with nice papilla becomes somewhat, you know, difficult to manage. And, you know, I need to produce treatment here, not only for this patient who's 18 years old, but for her mother that's looking over my shoulder. So let's see if we can go ahead and, and, and using everything we've learned, okay, from in diagnosis and from literature and create a predictable environment. And how are we going to do this? Well, I ask my friend, the orthodontist, can he take the two lateral incisors and move them into the central incisor position? And that way, when he's done that, what am I dealing with? Not two adjacent teeth, but two single tooth sites. And those two, two single two sites have bone in the appropriate position to support, right, this interceptal bone to support papilla. And that interceptal bone is going to be maintained, right, by the periodontal ligament and the adjacent, you know, to structure. So I've taken a difficult environment and created it into a predictable environment. Now I can begin my digital process. And we take the same two data sets. We take my intraoral surface scan. The laboratory does a diagnostic wax up and then integrates it with the cone beam CT scan and we do our implant planning. Okay, so it's always the same two data, set, data sets, cone beam CT scan along with intraoral surface scan or laboratory scan of models taken of the patient. We then use our evidence-based criteria that we learned about, right, to position and place our implant. So here we have our diagnostic, virtual diagnostic wax up profile. I look for the point where the profile of the tooth, where I want it to emerge from aesthetic point with the, with the soft tissues and then position the implant apical to that point. So I use my evidence-based parameters to create the plan, position the implant properly. The laboratory creates for me now my tools, my surgical guide, you know, using the intraoral scan intraorally with a patient with braces is, wow, what a difference from where we used to go ahead and have to remove the wire, take an impression, it would be pulled even on the brackets, even if I would block them out with wax. It's just so simple to go ahead and make a surgical guide going ahead and scanning the patient. We seat the guide, okay, if it's very accurately, I don't even have to remove the bracket during surgery prepare the correct osteotomy, and then I select the implant that was chosen in the planning. But here is a narrow platform out up advanced implant. You can see it's 3.25 millimeters in diameter by 13 millimeters long. And the implant is placed to the correct height, not based upon where that height of bone is, where it exists, but based upon my plan, right? I need to place it apical enough to be able to, to develop a you know, proper emergence profile and proper position relative to the soft tissue. So I carve out the parabolic architecture of bone to where the implant is, leaving the adjacent interceptal bone to support the papilla on either side. And then I'm going to manage the concavities that exist. And we're always going to have that with congenitally missing teeth. Most of the time is adequate width of bone, but there's still a, con a, a concavity of bone in that area. I harvest connected tissue from the palate and place it into a pocket on the buckle of each one of these teeth. I then take the provisional crown that's machined from the data set, right, of the virtual wax up. This one is designed to fit to a tie base and I insert them and you can see how precisely, even in this narrow position, the implants are able to go ahead and be placed with the screw access hole. This is pre-angle correction systems, so they're really placed precisely and suture the patient and the patient can go home. Now the patient comes back, this is six months later, okay? Six months later, left to heal for the morph. I wanted to have very mature soft tissue and you can see the abundance of soft tissue that I have, right? And even you can see where the papilla position is. 
And now I can carve out with a laser. You can do this also with a scalpel, but I carve this out with a laser, right? And you can see I create my parabolic architecture, giving even more appearance of papilla. And then the case is, is finished. And it can be done relatively predictably. So by going and changing the environment from where I started, which is very difficult and unpredictable, create single tooth sites, right? Use precise planning in terms of placement of the implants, I can end up with a very predictable result for my patient. Let's look at another patient. So a little more complex, but I'm showing you another patient also congenitally missing two mandibular anterior teeth. So you can see here are the two teeth that are remaining and the orthodontist in this case closed down the space to leave a one tooth space. In doing so, the labial bone was lost and a mucogingival defect was created. And so case is a little more complex than the previous case. Now it looks like there's adequate width between the adjacent roots and plenty of vertical height of bone. But when I take my CT scan, look at the width of bone. Wow, remember I said most of the time I have adequate width? Well, here I certainly didn't. And so if we were to place an implant to bone, look how much of that implant is going to be sticking out of bone. And yes, I know you could go ahead and do a regenerative procedure uh, over that. I look for predictability and I want to be very effective. And I want to go ahead and maintain this implant for a very long time. This patient is 18 years old. So I'm going to want to graft this space before I even begin. So if I look and see where the proper implant position would be using the criteria that we had before, right? And so my measurement is going to be apical to where I want my regional margin to be, right? Well, that's the area where I first would have enough bone height to place it into existing bone. So let's see what the procedure is going to be. And there can be many different techniques to regain bone. This, here's what I chose. And that was to take, go to that same site, right? And harvest monocal cortical blocks of bone. So apical to the area where the implants are going to be placed and then move them coronally, right? So I'm going to go and take the bone apically and move it coronally. And then I'm gonna allow it to heal and come back afterwards and place implants into healed bone. So here, here's my, uh, my flap. I've designed it so that I can do a perinatal lateral, perinatal sliding flap, flap, and that's how I'm going to correct the mucogingival defect. So I've taken my cores of bone. They're circular uh, for no specific reason, except that the type of kit I used a Meisinger kit to go ahead and do it. It's an easy way for me to harvest and secure the bone and shape the bone in that area. So I've placed the bone. I've grafted over that area. I've done a lateral sliding flap to go ahead and correct the mucogingival defect. And there you can see the radiograph of how it appears on that day. Here we are five months later, and you can see that uh, we've got nice soft tissue covering that area, and we've corrected most of the defect that we have, you know, mucogingival defect in that, in that area. And if we look at our CT scan that we've taken now, compared to where we started, right, we'll see that, you know, looking at this area, here the intersection is, is the diameter of the implant. This is three-shaped software, and so this outer dimension is a safety zone, but this is the implant. There's more than adequate bone to place the implant as opposed to where we began. Now, I follow my same protocol. I take my cone beam, C, cone beam CT scan. I take my intraoral surface scan. I the laboratory will merge the two data sets and complete the plan for adequate positioning of the implant using our evidence-based criteria. Patient comes for surgery. I reflect the flap so I can remove the screws, seat the surgical guide, prepare the osteotomy. Here I just have a, a implant body try-in. I always like to see uh, uh, and be sure, even though I've done this in a guided fashion, that uh, you know where the implant position is going or depth position is going to be. And again, a paltop narrow platform implant was going to be placed here. So here you see placed to the correct depth, so it's not at the crest of the ridge. How do I know what the correct depth is? Well, that's what we do in the planning. We look at the virtual wax up. We look at the profile of the gingival tissue. We may take our evidence-based measurements and position the head of the implant, All right? So here's our implant in position. I take my ISQ measurement to make sure I like the stability of the implant. And then I carve out the parabolic architecture, right? Leaving the adjacent interceptal bone to form the papilla. 
but I need to remove the bone in this segment because I'm, I need to create that scalloped appearance of the free gingival margin, you know, later on. And now I take some more connective tissue. My general rule of thumb is in these aesthetic cases is a little connective tissue is good, more is better. So I am continually building the soft tissue. It's uh, not an additional surgery, it's at the same visit. And there you see the implant in position. Now we've waited another four months. Again, this is because not only for the soft tissue, but I've also placed it in this you know, monocortical block. And so it may require additional healing time because there's not a lot of medullary bone there. And so here you can see my the healed implant. You can see that the nice, thick, you know, robust soft tissue that I've developed. And so I don't want to disturb it more. So I've kind of punched out that tissue because I have a lot of nice tissue here. I've gone and created some mechanical retention and relined my provisional, you know, using the concept of a concave profile in these areas, right? Allow the soft tissue to heal, take final impressions, and create tie-based restorations, right? And this is a zirconia tie-based res tie restoration layered with porcelain. And here you see it inserted inside the patient's mouth. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I'm fairly happy with the with the uh, the result. Yeah, here perhaps I could have gotten a you know uh, you know a little more tissue, or you know maybe I should just scallop out the soft tissue here. But the patient and her mother were pretty happy. We have really good bone levels. We have healthy soft tissue, and coming from a relatively complex case. Again, now I'm not saying it's a simple case, but we follow you know protocols using everything we have at our disposal using our comb beam CT, using, uh, using to analyze initially, to analyze healing, using ISQ measurements, using intraoral surface scanning, using digital planning, using digital materials. And so we can take complex cases and provide predictable solutions for them. Now, this is going to be the end of what I will call part one of this lecture, creating predictable outcomes. And there's going to be a part two that will be up and coming um, we are going to have live questions in just one or two minutes so you can prepare your questions but if i don't answer them or you think of something afterwards you know you can always email me at my email which is m.klein at paltopdental.com but i'm going to give you a little trailer you know to make sure you show up and come back for the next uh, for the next webinar for part two of uh, of this of this lecture, which will be in the next several weeks, you'll get notification. So we're going to talk about new concepts in digital guidance, which is contra-angle basis guidance, a system that I developed with you know the engineers at uh, at Altop Advanced Dental Solutions, and we took into account. Uh, factors that people were concerned about. And that was, you know, how do you properly irrigate when you're doing fully guided cases? And we did that by creating an irrigation window that allowed irrigation through the entire drilling process. So this is something that's unique to, uh, to fully guided systems. And then we looked at, well, you know, how do you go ahead and how do you manage limited interarch space? Because with so many systems, right, when you have to lift that drill and the drills are very long, right, how do you get into the posterior areas of mandibular maxilla? So we enabled it so you could do angled entry into the sleeves, again, by the nature of, of contra-angled based guidance. And then we thought, okay, you know, sometimes, you know, doctors will see metal shavings because the drill, as it's guided by the sleeve, cuts the, 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 uh, the titanium that's in the sleeve and you end up with, right, little, uh, little bits and pieces of titanium that you try and suction as best you can. And, and if you don't get something, you say, well, it's titanium, it's probably okay. But we have no metal cutting flutes that spin against metal. And so you can see here, there's, uh, there's no titanium and never will be titanium debris, you know, in this field. We talk about, we'll talk about simplifying sequential extraction strategies, and that's using digital concepts and digital protocols and digital materials to go ahead and have a very program response to significantly reduce the time in, sequ in sequential extraction uh, therapy treatment. We'll talk about concepts of virtual technician, right, and how to enable your office to do things in a way that they never did them before. 
We'll talk about how to manage, you know, the compromised patient in a very effective and efficient manner. You know, like our patient, we started with Carol, who's 96 years old. Right. You know, how are you going to go ahead and treat her? We'll talk about that as well as multiple other you know, protocols and techniques and concepts that use our digital tools and digital protocols and digital ideas, thinking differently and how to think differently than we normally went ahead and have done. So, again, I want to thank you for attending. Please visit the Paltop Academy site, and now we'll have uh, uh, questions and, and answers. Thank you for attending and listening. So uh, now we'll have our questions and answers. Let me show you, uh, I didn't show you before, how to get to the Paltop Academy website. Here you see it's www paltopacademy.com. Actually, there's a dash between um, Paltop and Academy. Okay, so let's go and let's answer questions. Here is, uh, let's say, the first question that I'm going and seeing. And the question I see here is, do you can, hi, Michael, do you contribute the high initial stability to the type of implant used? And so we discussed this in our in our uh, you know lecture that we just uh, had, and the answer is yes. The the stability of the implant is a function of the geometry of the implant, as well as the combination of the surgical protocol and cutting tools. With Paltop, we have within the same overall geometric design different styles of implant. We have the advanced implant. We have the advanced plus. We have the PCA or conical connection. We have the uh, dynamic implant. We have the PI implant, which is the more Paltop active implant. Now, all of them, except for the PI, have essentially the same external geometry, but the advanced implant has, or the classic advanced implant, has a rounded apex, which is good for placing in proximity to the sinus or some vital structure. You're concerned about the apex for the advanced plus and the PCA, the conical connection, have the same exact exact external geometry, um, and they have uh, the same geometry as the advanced, but there's one cutting thread at the apex. And the dynamic has a slightly more aggressive thread on it. So generally, unless the bone is very dense, you go ahead and you drill one less drill size. So you use the final diameter drill for the size that's uh, uh, the previous or narrower diameter. So for example, for a 4.2 millimeter implant, you would finish with a 3.75 millimeter drill, but use your surgical experience to that. Now, in conjunction with that, you see I like to use ISQ measurement. So it's a function and you need to use some of your clinical experience of analyzing um, uh, the size of implant, the type of potential occlusal function that might be on an even relieving the occlusion, you know, other adjacent teeth to protect it? Is it splinted coming around the arch? And you need to put all that together to make a determination if you should go and be immediately provisionalizing an implant. But yes, the implant uh, geometry does affect that. There's a question here and it says, are there other companies other than Paltop that have a concave design? So Paltop, you know, was, uh, was uh, if not the originator, one of the original companies with a concave design, but other companies that have concave design, because you'll see it's becoming more and more popular. Why? For all the reasons that we discussed in terms of getting predictability, a very healthy, robust soft tissue will have it maybe in their final component design. And Paltop is one of the only companies that actually goes and makes a full line of components, everything from the healing abutment through provisional co components, through impression components, including scan abutment designs that all incorporate that concave design, which will go ahead and maintain that through the entire procedure, the healing and structure of the soft tissue that you so carefully developed. I have a question here that says, um, is the temporary abutment, uh, you're using a peak made? So in the first case that you saw, as well as the, as the other cases, um, I use a peak compo component as a provisional component. That's exactly what it's made of. And I use acrylic. That's why I cut mechanical retention because the acrylic will not stick to it. 
Um, and so therefore I cut mechanical retention. If you're going to use flowable composite to reline it, then you don't need to cut that retention. There are also other types of temporary components um, that are made of titanium that you can also go ahead and, and utilize. And, and if you attend, or when you do attend the part two of this, you'll see those types of components. Next question. What is your criteria if you need to put a temporary abutment and a crown in an immediate extraction implant case uh, placement procedure? Well, you know, I place the temporary abutment and crown if I want to immediately provisionalize the case. And there are several reasons why I may want to go ahead and do that. You know, I always believe in not placing unnecessary risk. So only if I have reasons to immediately provisionalize it, which, which adds that risk, okay, because the patient may function on it even if you relieve the occlusion, right? So generally, it's going to be one of two reasons. One, because aesthetically, from a, from a, a provisional standpoint, a provisional aesthetic standpoint, I don't have any other option. So if I have another option, which might be going and using adjacent teeth, either uh, uh, you know uh, cantilevering a tooth off from a, a provisional bridge from an adjacent tooth, or going and uh, making a provisional Marilyn bridge that's bonded into place, or going and have a, a transitional removal partial denture, I would opt for that. But if I have no other alternative, okay, and for aesthetic reasons only, I need something provisional, that's one rationale for immediately provisionalizing the case. And the second has to do with development of the soft tissues. So I believe in trying to maintain things as opposed to rebuild them. We see in a lot of these cases, or the cases I showed you, I had to rebuild things. And so if I have papilla in the right place, and if I have the free gingival margin in the position I'd like it to, I'd rather maintain what I have. And so that's another reason to go ahead and use immediate provisionalization. Next question. Okay, we have a, a shout out from Spain. Hey, Spain. How you doing? Uh, stay safe and healthy. I know you're having a difficult time, but uh, we all are wishing you our best wishes. Okay, we have another question. And the question is uh, about close tolerance literature supports the importance of, uh, of machining to reduce micro movement. Does the same literature lead you to choose a conical connection rather than internal hex? Okay, so the particular cases that I showed you happen to be internal hex. Um, and that's because these are some older cases before uh, Altop even had their PCA or conical connection implant. So the outside geometry is the same, it's just the connection itself. And the concept, you know, I'll say the pretty much accepted con uh, concept internationally is that you're going to have a better seal because that's the purpose of that conical connection, creating a better seal against bacteria. Uh, I think I've demonstrated that, uh, you know, although that's the common concept, and, and I believe in that, because of the precision machining of the PALTOP components or the way the connection fits between the abutment system and, and the abutment through the study that I went ahead and presented showing that even in the, uh, the internal hex connection, we're getting excellent results. So, you know, uh, my concern is that if you're making restorations and you or your laboratory are using aftermarket components, not original manufacturer components from Paltop, then you're not going to have those same tolerances and you may not obtain the same results. So we obtained excellent results and you should expect all the things that I've shown here, whether you use the conical connection or the internal hex connection from, uh, from Paltop. And another question here, and it said, um, you know, is the guide an open system or, or closed system? Okay, so the guide system is tied to the planning libraries. And the, these planning libraries exist in Three Shape Implant Studio. They exist in Exoplan, the new surgical plan guide system from, uh, from Exocad. They exist in Blue Sky Bio. They exist in, you know, a number or all of the major planning systems. So when you select, when you're using this system, you're going to select the library from Paltop, okay? And that's how you're going to design the guide. If you choose to choose, use another implant system, I'm not sure why you would, but um, you, know, you would select a Paltop system and it would put that Paltop sleeve. 
if you try to go ahead and use Haltop's fully guided system, which we will talk about next time with, uh, uh, with the guy designed by it. So, you know, the, the drills that work for the system of some, from some other company won't work with the Haltop fully guided system. And so you need to use Haltop fully guided drills. The only other drills that will work with the system are actually the Versa drills. And we'll talk about that in the next system, in the next uh, uh, segment of this lecture, um, because Versa drills and Versa techniques can be used with Paltop's fully guided system. And one more question. Uh, are there any other fixation materials that can be used aside from the monocortical screws to stabilize the bone graft? You know, thank you. Um, and so, you know, to you know, the, the key to having any of your bone grafts or any of uh, of your things heal is stabilization. The implant has to be stable, or it will not heal. The the uh, any type of graft, regardless of its whether it's a monocortical block or a particulate graft or some type of any type of regenerative technique, you need to have immobilization of membranes, immobilization of the graft material. Anything that moves will become encapsulated in, in fibrous soft tissue. So you need to be able to fixate it in some manner. The, the only way that I know of fixating monocortical block grafts is using, uh, is using bone screws. And there are lots of different systems. Um, most of them work fairly well. It's what works best you know, in your hands and understanding the, the technique. Well, I think we're finished with our questions for now. Um, thank you for attending. Um, if you missed it, if you wanna tell your friends about this lecture, um, if you wanna see it again, here's where you go. Go to Paltop Academy, right? www.paltop-academy.com and you'll find all kinds of material about Paltop system, as well as links to Keystone systems, both Prima and Genesis, their systems. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see a repeat of this lecture as well as many, many other interesting informer materials. Thank you for attending. Um, I look forward to seeing you in our next lecture and attending all our other lectures that we have. And our next one is going to be on Sunday morning um, with Dr. Bernard Dahan. And it's, it, it, it looks like it's going to be a fascinating lecture. He's an excellent, excellent lecture talking about, you know, aesthetic guidelines and techniques. Thank you. Have a great day. Everybody stay healthy.